the that is a pile of kids right how awesome is that we just lost like a third of the congregation <laughs> that's cool but yeah first corinthians chapter 4 verses 1 through 13 Paul writes, this is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am uh, not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Verse 5, Therefore I do not pr pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers that you may learn by us to not go beyond what is written, that none of you may be purified up, uh, be rather puffed up in favor of, uh, uh, of one against another. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. Without us you have become, you have become kings. And would that you did reign so that we might share the rule with you. For I think that God has exhibited in uh, us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death. Because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. To the present hour we hunger and thirst. We are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless. And we labor, working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become and are still like the scum of the world. The refuse of all things. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this day and for your blessings. We thank you that we can come together and, and just discuss your word and learn more about you and worship you, Lord. We, uh, we just pray that you would help us to understand and uh, just bless us with skillful and godly wisdom, Jesus. We praise you and worship you. It's in your name we pray, Lord. Amen. So... This uh, sermon title was The Branding Iron. Uh, I don't know, I thought it was kind of fitting for where we live, right? Uh, but it'll make sense, uh, I promise. So, Paul saw from our text this morning, and, and those of you who are visiting, like, you find yourself at this random spot in the middle of Corinthians, but we're actually going through the entire book. So, that's how it works here. We... we uh, go through sermons expositionally. But <clears throat> in any case, Paul in this passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 13, saw that the Corinthians were not good at making judgments about other people. They were not good about making evaluations about other people. And I think that Paul wanted to help them make better judgments not only to help them make better judges of character and such, but also to free them from this bottomless pit that they were, they were trapped in, that they were stuck in, 
right? Like uh, this endless cycle of bad judgment. It like Paul saw that this this uh, uh, this this way of judging, the way that the Corinthians had their method of judging, uh, it it kind of trapped them. It held them, right? So Paul corrects them. He begins the idea, I think, interestingly, with the phrase, this is how one should regard us. This is how one should regard us. So right off the bat, this changes from one idea to the next, like what he's talking about. In other words, Paul's saying to the Corinthians, you should not regard us based on the way that you are thinking which is wrong, according to Paul, uh, which we'll see in verse 5 in a moment. He says, but you should regard us in a different way. So, verse 5 says, uh, therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time. Do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. So, the Corinthians thought of themselves as very good evaluators. They thought of themselves as very good judges of character, of people, and they, they prided themselves in it. Right? This was one of their, like, social tactics of climbing the ladder, as as we've discussed before. Uh, But the problem is, the Corinthians were not evaluating how they were evaluating. And Paul evaluated their evaluation process and saw that it was faulty. Say that five times fast. Uh, But like... uh, The Corinthians were were judging based on small perceptions. In other words, they were not seeing the whole picture of a person, right? Uh, and and they, were, they were writing people off based on like those small pictures that they had of people. Like, uh, they were essentially branding people. Psst, right? That's what it sounds like, right? Uh, but like... Uh, sometimes this is called labeling, right? You know, you know, some people label other people, right? Uh, like when you get an idea about a person in your mind, you label the whole person as such. For instance, like you've seen this person be messy with their food or something like that. <clears throat> uh, and, and they spilled something all over themselves and you brand them as messy. Like they're just a mess, right? Or like, uh, like you've seen them, perhaps, uh, perhaps you've seen a person uh, say something inappropriate to a female one time. So then you label them as a womanizer, right? You brand them, or you know, uh, perhaps you. Uh, heard a sermon by a preacher, and uh, you you heard the, you you thought it was a dud, right? Like if you're visiting, though, I want you to know that if this if you think this sermon is a dud, just don't think that you know. Maybe give it a few more times, right? <laughs> but seriously, I think the question that we should be asking ourselves is how much do you trust your own judgment? Like how much? stock do you hold in your own judgment about other people, right? Like, I I think this is valuable, especially for us to think about even now. Like, when you brand people or label them, like, uh, do you write them off? Do you think less of them? This is what the Corinthians were doing. They considered themselves ultra crepidarians in the sense of uh, like wanting, like thinking that they knew everything about a person right off the bat, 
You know, they, they could spend five minutes with a person and know everything about them. That was the mentality of the Corinthians, right? They were, they were climbing the top of the social ladder. And, and like one of their societal tactics was to step on the heads of other people to get to the top. To quickly think that they knew everything there was about a person so that either they could, uh, they could use them to succeed in order to climb the ladder or they could just dismiss them as uh, refuse, so to speak, like rubble, useless. And I think like some of the issues with this are obvious. Do you see them? Like in verses uh, 6 and 7, Paul says, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written. What is he talking about there? That, you, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. For who sees anything different in you? I think what Paul is saying is that I am trying to be an example for you. That you will not go beyond the boundaries of what scripture teaches about human wisdom and judgment. In other words, he's saying, don't think too highly of yourselves in the way that you make judgments, in the way that you evaluate. I think like the point of all this is that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. Like, I think that all of this really boils down to grace, right? If you brand a person and you label them, like branding a person kind of immediately robs them of your grace. Do you see the problems with that? Branding a person immediately robs them of your grace. Think of it like this. When you're married and you brand your spouse as someone who always does this one thing, right? Or, or someone who never does this one thing. What does that do for your relationship? Like, it, it, it hurts, right? Like, uh, to have that mentality, you know? Like, uh, I think all you're really doing is putting a distance between yourselves. Branding them robs them of your grace. In other words, by branding them, you're putting barricades of your grace in your way to that person. Does that make sense? Like, like, uh, like cattle, right? Uh, when you brand them, they just, they're just ultimately a means of making money or, or some means for your benefit ultimately. Work cattle once and you'll understand why we eat them, right? I, I don't know. I thought it was appropriate and also funny. But <clears throat> Paul says, Paul says, he's, he's saying, stop doing that, right? Like, your, your spouse is not a stepladder. You, like, people are not a stepladder, right? Uh by controlling, you know, your spouse or people in general, you're only frustrating yourself. Like, have you ever thought maybe I should let my spouse be who that person is, right? And I think it's kind of backwards the way we think, right? We try to control someone, and that is... Uh, what causes us frustration, right? Uh, like, man, you leave the cabinets open all the time, right? Or the toilet seat is always up or whatever, you know, just silly things. Like, 
Satan's, he, he, uh, he leaves a trail for you to follow, you know? Uh, but like, I don't know. I, I think that uh, it's good for us to let people be who they are. Not in the sense of praying for them to change. Like if they're, you know, if they're obviously doing something wrong or bad. But like, in the sense of who the person is. Let your spouse be your spouse. And the majority of your frustrations will melt away. Love them for who they are and see what happens. And like you might, you might remember exactly why you married this person in the first place. Right? This kind of thing makes you fall in love all over again. I think reminiscing is like relationship glue. But it's hard to reminisce when all you see on that person are branding scars. Do you see how these can be such a distraction? Paul says that when the Lord comes, all will be exposed. In other words, what he's saying there is, don't trust too much in your own evaluations about people because you can only see a small picture of them. But when, when Jesus comes, when he returns... You, uh, rather, he will see the whole picture of a person. There will be no brands or labels on people. And set yourselves free from the branding iron, right? Branding irons are meant for cattle, not people. Make judgments by seeing the whole picture. And the only one who really can do that is Jesus. So don't put too much stock in your, uh, in your brandings. And Paul, he puts them in their place in verse 8. It's pretty, uh, pretty hardcore, right? Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. Without us, you have become kings. And if you, if you did reign, may we share our rule, the rule with you, O oh, Corinthians. Like he's kind of like, like uh, uh, using hyperbole. He's exaggerating like to make them look ridiculous like to, so that they can see their own ridiculousness. He shows them that it, it's... Uh, it's just wrong to try to climb the ladder and get everything they want when, and in the end, everything they have was okayed by God for them to have. In other words, the stamp of approval, everything that we have and do and own, all came from God's stamp of approval, right? Like, it's like Paul's asking the question, did you choose where and how you were going to be born? Did you choose where and how you were going to be born? Like, did you choose Montana, USA, United States of America in the 1960s or whatever? Right? How did you choose your birthplace? Did you choose the way that you were brought up? Like... Think of the hobbies that you have. Why do you like them? Have you ever thought about that? Why? Do you think that, uh, like, this, I don't know, the things that influenced you growing up, like, do they cause you to do and like the things that you do now? What caused those influences? Did God cause all, cause all of this? 
Did you cause all of, all of this to happen to you? Right? Did you ever think about that? Or, like, did, did it just happen to you? And you, you rode the waves, so to speak. Did God cause all of this? And by His grace, you are where you are. I think the point here is that the Corinthians should care less about what is at the top and care more about other people. Right? Like, all this stuff that you accumulate, material possessions, it is literally going to be burned away. Uh, I think our... uh, our Revelation series, like, uh, explained that, like beating a dead horse. But I, I don't think, like, Paul, Paul presents this problem, right? He presents this problem, uh, and he doesn't just let the Corinthians go to figure everything out, right? He, he like, gives them the antidote for poor judgment, He says that the way you evaluate yourself is backwards. He says, we are fools in Christ, and you are wise in Christ. He says, we are weak, but you are strong. And he's saying that if you humble yourselves before the Lord, then He will lift you up. In other words, think about this. The way up is down. Do you understand that? The way up is down. Humble yourselves before the Lord and He will lift you up. And this is the complete opposite of how man thinks, of how mankind has their methods. Like, it's it's hard for us to think this way. Naturally. We don't naturally think like this. We think survival of the fittest, right? We think we have to kick and scream our way to the top. Like... uh, the, the, this idea of you will reach success through poverty, right? You are made whole by being broken. Like, you, you, you have to, like, I, I don't know. You're made whole by being broken. Like, have you been broken before God? Like, when is the last time you said, okay, God, I can't do it. I am yours. Paul is teaching us here that Christians are to lead the way. We're we're to lead the way in the world by following Jesus. Do you see how like backwards that seems? We are to lead by following. Jesus is the picture of humility. Think about it. God came to earth in the body of Jesus Christ and made his dwelling among us. Jesus is the picture of humility. He left his throne and as being the only one to choose where he was born, right? Like we can't choose where we're born, but he can because he existed before he was born. 
John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. He left his throne. He chose the most humble of places. Through his hard life, he did great things. And in the end, he died a criminal's death, naked on the cross. The most painful and humiliating execution that the Romans could possibly conjure up. The most painful and the most humiliating execution that they could think of. The king of the universe died that death. And he did it all for you and me. Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? The Bible teaches us to repent of sin. Repent of your sins and receive eternal life by continually confessing Him as your Lord and Savior. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Like, think about that. Jesus died. The king of the universe died. The most painful, excruciating, and the most humiliating death that is possible for mankind to think of. This was the king of the universe. It's like, would you become an ant and, and, and tell people about humans, you know? Like, it's just a, it's such a wild thing to think of. The king of the universe died for me. Now, why did he do that? Because we needed it, right? Because we can't pull ourselves up by what? Our own bootstraps. We can't pick our bootstraps up and then we float away. You know what I'm saying? There's a problem. The Bible presents this problem. This problem is that we fail God. We rebel against God. Morally speaking, we've, uh, uh, we've sinned, right? All have sinned and fall short of God's glory. What is a sin? A sin is a lie. Or rather, a lie is a sin. Uh, uh, stealing something is a sin. Uh, committing adultery is a sin. And Jesus even takes that further and says, if you've done this in your own heart, then it's a sin. I think what Jesus is saying there is, look how desperately you need me. If you've looked at a woman with lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery with her. I think that Jesus is saying, look how desperately you need me. Look how badly you need me. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 6 verse 23 says, The wages of sin is death. In other words, the reason why we die is because of our moral failures against God. This problem that we have, that we're confronted with, right? There's a problem here. And the problem is we can't, 
We can't rescue ourselves. We can't fix our past. We need someone to do it for us. So, so the Bible says in Romans 6.23, uh, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So though you die, you will live. Do you see this? The difference of thought between uh, like how heaven thinks versus how the world thinks. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Now how do you do this? How do you get eternal life? Paul says in Romans chapter 10 verse 9, he says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. And what I find so fascinating about this is that Christianity is based on historical fact. Jesus died and rose again. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. Have you ever told a lie? Have you ever uh, thought bad thoughts about the, you know, about another person sexually in your mind? Have you ever stolen anything, even if it was like a pen or a, uh, you downloaded a movie online. You know what I'm saying? Like you downloaded a song somewhere. Somebody let you borrow a CD and you burned it to your computer, right? Like we don't even think about those things as stealing. But, but they're sure to let you know. But you just look the other way, right? Piracy is a crime. Blah, 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 blah. FBI, blah, 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 blah. Nobody pays attention to that. You know what I'm saying? Jesus came for you. And actually died in your place. And actually and historically rose from the dead. Christianity, God does not ask for us to believe blindly. It's not a blind trust. Christianity is not a blind trust. He's not asking us, just, just believe, you know, blind faith, blind trust. That's not the definition of faith. Our definition, the definition of faith, of Christian faith, is that it is evidence-based. Christians have evidence-based faith, right? Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord. Then you will be saved. I find that passage fascinating. That, uh, that word confess in Greek is in the aorist tense, which means it's an ongoing forever process. It means like confess forever, always. Jesus is Lord. Have you done that? You can know your creator. And you can have a personal relationship with him. 
Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for your love. We thank you that you left your throne in heaven, your perfect throne, your perfect place, and came to earth and took our place, took our place of punishment. Lord, I find it fascinating that in you we are adopted as children of God. Like when you, when the Father looks upon us, your blood, Jesus, is seen covering us. And in a sense, we are of, uh, of the same DNA. And we are, uh, we are adopted as God's children. But only by being covered by your blood. Lord, we worship you. Uh, Lord, I, I pray for this congregation and myself, that you would forgive us for our sins. That you would blot out our transgressions. Lord, your word says that when we pray that, that you, you don't listen if our heart is full of sin. But through Jesus, Lord, you, you make it so that we don't have to live with our hearts being full of sin. Your word says if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us for our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, we thank you that you hear our prayer. I pray, Lord, that you would have your blessings upon these people, everyone who hears my voice. That you would encourage these people Lord, use us for your honor and glory. Show us that there's more to life than, than what we see and how we live, live out our lives. Lord, help us to live what you tell us in John 17, 3. That, that eternal life is this, to know God and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. Lord, help us to know you and to make you known. You are the hope of the world, Jesus. We worship you. It's in your holy name, Lord, we pray. Amen. Stand, if you will, for one more song together this morning.